Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by ReviewMaxer. Hello and welcome to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd with Axia Public Relations. Today, I'm joined by Rick Backrack. He is going to talk to us today about famous connecting famous people and famous brands. Rick, welcome to the show. Jason, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to be here too. Uh, we've been working on putting this together for a while and uh, really glad you're here. I think today we want to talk about, of course, connecting famous people and famous brands. We also want to talk a little bit about what's going on with college football or excuse me, college sports and uh, you know name and likeness um, and uh, other topics that brands should be considering uh, when they are thinking about hiring or engaging an influencer, spokesperson, that kind of thing. Does that sound good, Rick? Sure, let's go. All right. Well, first, let me just have you do like a, you know, one, two sentence kind of introduction to yourself for the audience so they know your background and experience. Sure. Well, the long and the short of it is that I broker celebrity talent. I represent the buyers of celebrity talent. My clients principally are, are big brands and the agencies that represent the brands. And for, uh, for those brands that um, uh, are hiring people to endorse their product or work on be their behalf as a, as a spokesperson, uh, the practical reality is most of these brands do this occasionally. I do it all day, every day. And I've been uh, doing this for almost 40 years. I have put together a little bit north of 4,400 relationships between celebrities and brands. So there's not much I haven't seen. Rick, there's no doubt you're a veteran in the business. You've seen a lot of things. You've done a lot of things. That's why we asked you to be a guest on On Top of PR so you can help our audience stay on top of on top of PR. A lot of our audience may or may not be actively participating in these types of activities. Some of them may be doing it for the very first time. So maybe we could just kind of talk through what are some common uh, mistakes or misperceptions that people might have about this line of work. So I think, first of all, Jason, um, it's a great question. Um, there are some key components that, uh, that buyers need to think about, um, celebrity talent buyers. And, and the first is to understand process-wise uh, that relevance drives, every, drives everything. Anytime you engage a, a celebrity to endorse your product or work for your brand, uh, the, the number one thing you've got to think about is why does that relationship make sense? Where's the relevance? Um, you want to make sure that you find the fit between that celebrity and the brand. And, and uh, part of what you're doing is you're uh, looking at the attributes that the celebrity brings to the table, not just how popular they are, but what genre uh, they may work in and how their fame can connect to your product or service. It's got to be a, a logical and good fit. Uh, the next thing is uh, budget. Um, it's very easy to have champagne tastes and a beer wallet, but the, the beautiful thing is that uh, the, if we understand that there are, there's talent available for every budget, as long as you're flexible, you're always going to have uh, a, a good relationship. And so, Rick, uh, does your work include, I mean, obviously, I know you work with entertainers and celebrities. Um, do you also work with, uh, with kind of just influencers and content creators, or are you more focused on uh, different um, uh, celebrities? Yeah, so my focus really is on the celebrity world, and it's not that I don't work with influencers from time to time, but that mm -hmm. the influencer category really is separate. Um, it's distinctly separate from the celebrity category. And it's not that celebrities aren't influencers. Of course they are. Um, but the reality is, I think, as, as, as the word influencer is most commonly used today, that's in relation to people who have become famous uh, or achieved rel you know, some relative level of fame, primarily through a digital footprint the platforms that they're working on uh, either as bloggers or as YouTubers or things like that. So the, the, the channels are, are different. Um, they're not exactly the same, but um, yeah, my, my specialty for sure is what I'll call mainstream, uh, the world of mainstream celebrity. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's very helpful for uh, our audience to kind of understand a little bit of your perspective and experience. Um, can you talk about um, kind of 
when these types of partnerships go really well, Rick, what are some of the attributes that uh, you know companies benefit from and some of the synergies that are created? So, you know, uh, first of all, let's consider that we've got a variety of, of uh, communications and marketing disciplines. And of course, we've got the standard, the standard realms, uh, advertising, regardless of whether that's a television or um, a print or radio, but you've got, uh, you, you've got advertising and public relations are the two primary uh, categories of use. Of course, there's an endless variety of ways that, that companies engage with famous people. They, they work with them on hospitality. They work with them on um, uh, uh, employee engagement programs. They, they're, you see applications that are business to business driven, others that are business to consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no shortage of the ways that companies uh, use celebrities. And nor in the di different applications uh, in the various disciplines, advertising, marketing, PR, sales, promotion. Um, you know, the key components are, I think, always the understanding of what the celebrity brings to the table and more particularly, what's the role of a celebrity in relation to a brand. And in every single case, it's the same thing. Uh, the celebrity serves as the vehicle for the dissemination of corporate messages. It doesn't matter whether those messages are delivered through an ad campaign or uh, in their role as a PR spokesperson um, or at a, a client hospitality event uh, or what have you, or, or headlining a promotion. In every single case, that celebrity is there to deliver key messages for, for the company and the brand. Yeah, you're, I absolutely agree. You're absolutely right with that. Uh, speaking of one thing I see happen a lot is a company wants to engage someone. And then there's kind of what we would call in the business scope creep where they're like, oh, you know what? We're also having this extra event or could they also sign 200 autographs or, you know, there's just these added things that start happening when we've done this type of work with someone like you to help us, you know, with our client. And then next thing you know, the celebrities in town and they're like, gosh, you know, while they're here, I'd love to have them come to my son's birthday party or whatever it might be. So how do you how do you address those things up front, Rick? So you kind of are able to kind of identify what are these what if scenarios that may or may not come up and how do we kind of preempt them both, um, you know, or account for them in some way? So it's again, Jason, that's a wonderful point that you uh, bring up. Um, one of the things that I always counsel my clients on right out of the gate is the understanding that they are not buying a new best friend. <laughs> this is, right. this is an exchange uh, of, of uh, goods or money for services. Right. And what they have a right to expect and demand is delivery of exactly what we've contracted for mm -hmm. in exchange for compensation. And the same holds true for the talent, for the celebrity. The celebrity has a right to expect that uh, they'll be compensated um, exactly to the terms of the agreement and that they will be expected to deliver exactly to the specifications of the contract. Mm -hmm. So there, there's no technical scope creep. We all see it, but where it, more, it comes up more often than not are frankly with inexperienced uh, buyers. Mm -hmm. And that's an issue of educating our clients at the origin uh, of the relationship. Um, yeah. Actually, prior to negotiating the contract points, making sure that they understand, again, they're not there to buy a new best friend. We want everybody to get along great. We want these to be good and lasting relationships right. uh, that have some legs to them. Uh, but the reality is, Everybody needs to do exactly what is called for in the agreement. And then if they do, we'll get great results and everybody will be happy with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rick, I was recently talking to a client who was telling me they were going after an up and coming professional golfer and how they thought, you know, he doesn't currently have a sponsor. And so maybe this is an opportunity for them to kind of swoop in and get it. And, you know, we weren't involved at all, but my counsel to them was, okay, what's the scenario when they're not good or when they don't take off, when the potential isn't there? 
you know, how do you kind of pivot out of that agreement, you know, in a way that works for you? And at the same time, protect yourself for taking a chance on this person, right? Um, if they start to have this trajectory that's fantastic to where suddenly, you know, they're blown off or whatever it might be, you know, how do you kind of lock them in to an element of convenience where it's like, hey, I'm taking a risk on you to where it doesn't get to a point where this person's so successful, they feel like they're being taken advantage of. Yeah, and I, I think that reality is key to that, Jason. Mm -hmm. um, if if everybody enters the relationship, understanding where things are at, but also where they can go, both pro and con, mm -hmm. as you say, um, uh, the golfer may fail just as well as he may become, uh, he or she may become the next hot thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you, you know, in the case where you can't, where, where you may not have a history to predict an outcome, you build in flexibilities into the relationship so that right. both parties are prepared for what may come. Right, exactly. Yeah, well, Rick, with that, we're going to take a quick break and come back on the other side where we're talking more about connecting famous people and famous brands and maybe sometimes connecting uh, famous people with not yet famous brands that are hoping to become famous because of their connection with that, uh, with that celebrity. Otherwise, we'll be right back after these announcements. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. Welcome back. Glad you're still with us. I'm Jason, joined by Rick. We're talking about connecting famous brands with famous uh, people. Rick, what happens if we have a, uh, a, an obscure or unknown brand that wants to get connected with a famous person. Um, I'm guessing that's gonna be a lot of their budget, a lot of money for them to do it. Is that a way for them, a good way for them to get started or, or should they start with smaller opportunities? Yeah, well, you know, complex question. Um, we, at the root, Jason, I think you have to take a close look at that brand, although the brand may not be big or or well known. Uh, the first question that any celebrity is going to ask is, are they a good company? Are they a profitable company? How big are they? Um, celebrity use isn't designed for small business um, unless it's a small business that's owned by the celebrity. Huh, right. let, let, let's say that these are emerging brands or challenger brands. They may sure. be growing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll refer back to a pharmaceutical company that I worked with probably 25 years ago, 23 years ago, that at the time was a relative unknown. Mm -hmm. And and yet they were, they were a brand doing uh, a little over $100 million a year in sales. Now, they, they aggressively pursued celebrity contracts uh, in relation to um, uh, a nonprofit relationship that they were supporting. And the celebrities were integrated into, public, into a, a public education and awareness campaign, uh, which supported a nonprofit and ultimately drove business back to the pharmaceutical company's primary brand. Uh, that engagement worked very, very well. They followed aggressively that pursuit for about the next 10 years. And if you fast forward today, um, not just the company, but the brand is a multi-billion dollar a year brand. Um, so uh, it was a case where they were big enough to, to be able to support celebrity agreements. And uh, I think it should be noted that celebrity acquisition typically should represent between 15 and 20% of the, um, of the, of the um, budget that it's associated with. So for example, if, um, if the budget, if the engagement is really, let's call it a, a PR initiative, um, if you're spending $20,000 to secure the talent, the celebrity, the campaign itself should have a budget of a hundred thousand. There should be a five to one investment on the campaign itself versus the celebrity. 
That's not yeah. dissimilar, by the way, to a company that would acquire the rights to, let's say, the Olympic rings. Uh, somebody becomes an Olympic sponsor. If they spend $100 million on the acquisition of the Olympic rights to be an Olympic sponsor, they will be expect, expected to spend $500 million or $600 million in support of that relationship. That's about the right balance. And, uh, you know, again, there's talent available at every budget and you want to be, but you want to be appropriate and thoughtful. Now, in the case of a brand that's a relative unknown, part of what we will have to do is educate the celebrity world and the agent world, agents and managers, and let them know who this emerging uh, uh, brand is, why it's important and why it's an important opportunity that they get in early before the whole world knows who they are. Mm -hmm. So this could work two ways, um, you know, where maybe you're getting you're getting hitched to a celebrity that has a bright future and you want to get connected with them early and be part of their rise. And, and so you've been with them for a while. Similarly, maybe a celebrity or entertainer or athlete wants to associate themselves with a brand that they feel like might be uh, on the rise. Uh, so if you're looking at an emerging brand, brand Rick, how often is some ownership equity stock uh, part of the deal, especially for an emerge, emerging maybe technology or disruptive brand? Uh, and we're running out of time. So uh, if you give us a quick answer, how often do you see that? And, and does that often work well? Or is that something that, that you generally don't recommend? No, I do recommend and I think we're seeing more and more of it today. But we're also seeing the celebrities taking a more active role beyond just, hey, I'd like a piece of the company. Uh, you look at people like Ryan Reynolds, who took that approach first with Aviation Gin and then later with Mint Mobile and a few other brands. Um, uh, it wasn't just the case of give me a piece of the company. He dived in feet first and actually took on all of their creative direction for the development of their advertising and marketing campaigns. So we are seeing it more and it, it can be a great, uh, great way to enter the relationship. Right. Yeah. Well, it's unique also. I think when you've got a celebrity like Ryan Reynolds or um, um, I can't think of his name right now, where they bring, you know, some unique talent and capabilities to the table, resources to the table, um, you know, as well. So, um, all right. So we promised we'd get into name, image and likeness. Sure. Um, in case our audience doesn't know, you know, give us a, you know, kind of 10 second definition of what that means. And then we'll dive into a couple more questions before we wrap up. Sure. So uh, NIL license, which is name image likeness, um, first of all, was legislation passed by the NCAA this year, earlier this year, that essentially and effectively allows amateur athletes uh, to sell the, their endorsement rights. So they can now be compensated uh, by a brand or by an organization for the use of their name, their images, their likenesses. Uh, they can basically go out and advertise products, uh, uh, products and services and be compensated for it without losing their amateur status. Yeah, good. And, and that's a big step for uh, amateur athletics, right? It's a huge step. So you're seeing tremendous volume. At the NCAA level, colleges all across the country, there are very, very few schools, even smaller schools, mm -hmm. that are not in some way finding deals um, for, for the, their student athletes. Uh, more surprising, though, is actually the, the kids younger than that, because now you've got high schoolers, and I'm not saying there's a ton of them, mm -hmm. but you have exceptional high school talent. Uh, around this country, uh, baseball players in the state of Texas who are who are now finding these NIL deals. You've got a, a handful of kids making um, eight figures now. Oh, my God. Endorsing products. It's it's pretty crazy. It's a little mm -hmm. out of hand. Mm -hmm. NIL, though, also changes the landscape. Um, it skews it even more in favor of bigger schools, colleges and universities. Right. Right. Um, that have big broadcast contracts right. become, you know, not that they weren't attractive landing spots before. Yeah. But if you are, you talk about its value as a recruiting tool for yeah. a high school athlete, it really tips the scales. 
Well, the rich keep getting richer, and uh, hopefully this does not ruin, at least for me, college athletics and more specifically my personal passion, college football. So um, because I would hate to see that happen. And, um, you know, there's a saying money ruins everything. Um, There's also a saying that marketers ruin everything. So, you know, uh, this is kind of that one two punch of both coming together in a Venn diagram. So, uh, Rick, any closing thoughts on uh, uh, NIL? No, I think NIL is here to stay. Um, the The challenge with it right now is that it's uncharted territory. Right. We're less than a year into it, and everybody is learning their way through it. So you have compliance-related issues that the schools, uh, I think uh, the watchword for, for everybody is probably patience. Um, you know, so... Uh, I think that if the student athletes cooperate with the institutions and the institutions cooperate with uh, the representatives and the families, it, it's largely undefined. They're, they're kind of figuring it out as they go. So the more everybody can be patient, the better off they'll be. Mm-hmm. That's good. Well, that's always good, you know, as a good expression is to be earnest, uh, be patient, um, and make wise decisions and you can't make wise decisions quickly and you can't move too quick when you're making them. So, uh, Rick, if somebody is going through this or, a, a, uh, you know, whether it's a NIL or a celebrity type deal or whatever, and they either want, you know, a second opinion or they need an expert like yourself, how, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? Sure. Look me up on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is spelled on the screen. Um, uh, look me up on LinkedIn Email me at uh, Rick uh, dot at celebritycom and I love having new conversations and uh, uh, never never costs anything to pick up a phone and, and meet someone new and uh, would love to chat with folks about uh, whatever their needs are. Appreciate that, Rick. And you and I have met through PRSA and appreciate your uh, sponsorship there and your engagement. And if you weren't doing that, we probably wouldn't have met. And so I'm glad to have you here on the show and on top of PR. Also glad to, you know, talk to you a few times about a couple of client matters and get your input on them as well. I definitely felt smarter and more informed and and able to guide our clients a little better. And, you know, when they're ready, we'll talk again. So thank you for the opportunity today, Rick. Uh, With that, this has been another episode of On Top of PR. Thank you for your support of our show. Every month we get more and more uh, fans and followers and we appreciate it. We know it wouldn't be possible without folks like yourself. Uh, In addition, uh, and speaking of, if you found value in this conversation today, do us a favor, reach out to Rick and let him know, but also share this episode with a friend uh, or colleague who you think would benefit from it and uh, have some conversations around it with them or your team. And hopefully you will be able to use what you heard today and the insights we shared um, so that you might uh, have more success when you're engaging in sponsorships and celebrity endorsements and, and other things. So with that, this is Jason Mudd signing off, helping you stay on top of PR. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and check out past shows at ontopofpr.com. <laughs>